Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul Tutorials in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1. In this video we're going to continue talking about space planes. Now we identified a need that we had in the previous episode with the air intakes not being able to be scaled right and we had grotesquely large air intakes so we need tweak scale and this follows a pattern that I would like to point out. I only put the mods in when I know I need them and I have to be pretty darn convinced that I need them. I don't overload the install with a whole bunch of mods in anticipation for needing them. I just find out that I need them and then put them in. So this saves me from a whole lot of mod conflicts in general. And if you find that you uh, end up having issues, maybe slow down on packing in the mods at the front end and just uh, let, let the natural flow of things suggest which mods you need. But uh, so... Here we've got tweak scale, it says 1.4.1 and above, and it says here it works with 1.9, so okay. Um, let me just go to GitHub per normal. Uh, we'll just go with the latest release and hope that everything works out. I like the version to be a little bit more specific to the version that I'm using, but we can go with this. So, alright, so this is our install. And game data, tweak scale, uh, 999 scale is also something we need. So local, I guess we should add that in. I don't know what that's all about. But uh, we've got a much better version of module manager. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it worries me that the module manager version is so old uh, when it's packed with this. But then again, this was packed in on March 3rd of this year. So it's not too bad. Okay, well, we'll take it. So that's one thing. Another problem that we had was we didn't have very good RCS thrusters. Now, um, RCS thrusters aren't exactly something that are easy to find. And there is one set that I like from KW Rocketry. I hope this version from Linux Guru Gamer, this KW Rocketry Balanced, hasn't changed the part names. Um, but we'll get this one. And I'm going to show you how to dissect a, well, one way to dissect a mod so that you just get certain parts. So we're going to download this, but this is a big mod. It's got a lot of parts in, right? Uh, 133 megabytes. I don't want all those parts. Most of them are completely useless to me. I'm going to unzip it though. Okay, we've got KW Rocketry in here. And we'll keep the community fixes and everything. Parts. Uh, arrow. Well, um, I don't need those arrow parts. Uh, control. Radio SAS, not really. Uh, electrical, I actually like these batteries. I'm going to keep them. Um, these engines are useless. The fairing bases are useless. We've got procedural fairings. Uh, fuel, I, I don't remember liking the universal tanks at all. RCS is where we're at. We'll keep these. Solids, you might. They are actually very nice solids, especially the LH rockets. So I'll keep them, actually. And these structural things we can delete. Uh, so having started with uh, 100 megabytes, we end up with 15. So that's basically how it is. That saves on a little bit of loading time and also on the RAM that it uses because all this stuff gets packed into the RAM right away. All right, so with that, let's start the game. Now, just one caveat about selecting parts out of mods. Make sure that the mod includes all the relevant files for the parts in the same folder like the .mu file which is the model file, the texture files which are uh, JPEG PNGs or DDSs, and the configuration file. A mod like SSTU Labs puts the configuration files in separate folders from the model files and the texture files so it's tough to figure out exactly how to delete certain parts from a mod like that and there are other mods that do that as well. Uh, FASA makes it easy. If you just want to have Apollo, then you can feel free to delete the Gemini and Mercury folders or so forth and thereby uh, trim up your install. So anyway, we've got tweak scale. So uh, we can take a look at how much area the jet engine needs, which is 0.316. And since we have two air intakes, that means 0.158 each. And we could reduce the scale of these. 
and then we could probably shift them back and that will reduce drag, reduce mass and improve efficiency. We probably don't need such a thick wing root either. If we wanted to reduce our um, drag further, we could probably reduce the root width. That wasn't really necessary. Um, we could increase the utilization of the kerosene here. Uh, the size of the wing, I think, okay, so it's 320 units now. So if you increase the wing root, the thickness of the wing root, and then right click on this, you'll see the kerosene amount has increased. So the thicker the wing is, the more it can carry in terms of fuel. So keep that in mind. But this isn't going to be the setup that we use for a space plane because the mark, uh, this uh, 1.25 meter cockpit, I mean, I say space plane, I mean the orbital space plane. This was a space plane, it got to space. Okay, uh, but you know, just like the X-15, but it doesn't have the, wait, this, this one is the one we have right now. It doesn't have the heat tolerance. It's got 1800 Kelvin. Uh, we want this 2200 Kelvin. Even then, I'm not sure it's enough. We'll see. But this one is bigger, as you can see. So we have to do a whole reshaping of this. And I've already done that. I... We want a carrier plane plus the space plane. So the carrier plane is going to bring it up to space, uh, going at a fairly high velocity, release it, and then this will continue on its way to orbit. Meanwhile, the carrier plane will have to land somewhere. Uh, I, my plan is to take off from Brownsville in Texas, and the carrier plane will land in Cape Canaveral. We'll test the carrier plane in this uh, video. We might uh, wait until the next time to test the combination, I'll see. Uh, so... I've already done some of the work here. Uh, the carrier plane I developed during a live stream, it wasn't completely developed during the live stream because it blew up a few times, uh, and I'll explain. But first, we also need to figure out what the mass that the carrier plane is going to have to carry will be, and that means building the blue up into a fuller version. So, uh, we've got some spoilers here, but I went to blue 2 first. Blue 2 uh, improved the air intakes, of course, and then also included this uh, streak here to improve the aerodynamics, especially if you recall the cross-sectional area curve. You can see there's a much more pleasant curve now, as uh, less of an indentation here. And so, yeah, that was the first step. Step 2 was sizing things up. And so we have the bluer. And the bluer looks a lot sleeker now, as you can see. And we still have the same jet engine in the back. There's the same one, F404, that we used before. But we've changed the rocket engines because this is obviously heavier. We needed more powerful ones. And there's the RD58, or S1.5400. Uh, these are the OMS engines. Well, at least if you choose the right configuration here. So go to engine, show UI. And down here, the 17D12, that's the configuration for Beren's uh, OMS engines. And that gives you 15 ignitions, 362 seconds ISP with Sintin and liquid oxygen. Sintin is a form of kerosene. It's a highly reformed version. So that's about as good as you're going to get. It's a little bit more expensive than normal kerosene. Uh, so that's one thing. But, you know, yeah, the fuel prices aren't the big thing here. So we've got Sintin in here, and of course in here we've got the spare kerosene for the jet engine. It's sort of like reversed, but that's the idea. And what we come up with in terms of mass is about 30 tons. And uh, with this, the rocket engine, rocket engines, uh, can give us 0.58 thrust to weight ratio and about 4,000 meters per second of delta V. But there is a problem, and this is why the carrier plane was blowing up uh, during re-entry, not re-entry, but you know, it, it was going 3000 meters per second, so it's getting pretty hot. Uh, and these procedural integral structure tanks have fairly low heat tolerance. You can see 773 to 873 Kelvin, 873 is for the skin, 773 is for the body. That's not great. That's not great at all. And unfortunately, of these new tanks, none of them seem to have... Uh, well, this one has a steel thing going on here, separate structure of steel, but they, uh, they uh, why does that not have a better heat tolerance since it's steel, I don't know. But 
Um, none of these have better heat tolerance apparently. Now there are a lot of tank types that we could choose from here, but it's aluminum, aluminum high pressure, aluminum copper, aluminum copper, aluminum lithium, which is like the, shut, uh, the space shuttle's external tank eventually, the super lightweight one, and composite, which composites don't really have very good heat tolerance, and then magic, which God only knows why we have a magic one. But um, yeah, so none of these have very good heat tolerance. And so we go back to the old procedural tanks that we have here, thankfully not deprecated yet, because this is the only tank that has a good heat tolerance. Unfortunately, it also weighs a lot. Um, so we can see here uh, this tank, uh, 332 kilograms dry. If we put one of these shielded tanks, just one, and make it roughly the same size. Okay, so this is 10 meters, 2.2 .2 and 1.7. This is 2.2, uh, 1.7, 10 meters. You can see this dry mass is 1.171 tons without any fuel. This is 332.1. If we put the centin and liquid oxygen in here, that's 20.75 tons. This one, 30 tons. So 10 tons more with this tank. So, well, that changes the design again, doesn't it? Um, so I had to make some concessions because of that. And so we've got the bluer no jet. We don't have the jet engine on the back anymore. And, you know, it's a space plane. It's not going to be taking off on its own anyway. Um, so now we've got the shielded tank. And also up here, this little tank also is shielded and so is the one on the tail. Now, in theory, some of this section would not be subject to, you know, uh, heating, but I don't know how well Kerbal detects the airflow to see that it's blocked, if you know what I mean. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, like this little section here might be completely not exposed. Now, these are not currently um, what you got shielded tanks. And that's because of something I noticed with the carrier plane, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, that, for some reason, the ones on the side did not seem to blow up, but, you know, we'll see. I mean, maybe they'll blow up, I don't know. Uh, we have to actually test this out. I haven't flown this at all, so... It's going to be a thing. We still got a mass strength multiplier of 1, because that's standard for the space planes here. And you can see I've kept it to 30 tons, 4,000 meters per second still. So we've got the same basic stats that we're looking for. And so the carrier plane is going to lift, try and lift this 30 tons and try and get it to uh, velocity fast enough so that 4,000 meters per second. But I don't think that's going to be enough. We need like 5,000. Uh, can we get this to 5,000? Well, that increases a lot of... We're going to have to see about that. I don't know if this is going to be enough. Uh, this idea of putting a plane like this on top of a carrier plane was actually the one of the original shuttle ideas. And a lot of the shuttle proposals went with this until they had to put in a cargo bay. Well, a big cargo bay. A small cargo bay is fine. Small cargo bay, you can, do, you can just skyline it. What you do is you put it right in the center and uh, just lengthen the fuselage and you have a uh, tank in front of it and tank in back um, so you split the tanks up in two and everything works and that's how Skylon does it and that's great until like the cargo capacity has to be large like physically large like it is in the shuttles so anyway I'm just thinking about whether I made any other notable changes here I don't think so so let's talk about the carrier plane. So the stream peoples called decided to call it Delsinea. I, they proposed Rosinante first, but I struck that down because um, expanse is the expanse. So we have a, a sort of a dummy payload there. Uh, here it was 28 tons, but uh, we'll eventually go to 30 tons. And we don't have a huge choice of cockpits, which is part of the problem here. Uh, I would actually mu much rather have the smaller cockpit, but given what we've got, this Mark III cockpit is probably the best choice. The Mark II cockpit is just too small um, to carry something of this load, right? We're going to need tanks of a certain size, so 
we need the Mark III cockpit size uh, and to get it to uh, match up with our procedural tanks because that's um, they're still better than trying to use the Mark III tanks. The Mark III tanks are heavier in dry mass. Uh, we use this Mark III to 6.5 meter adapter and then this tank you see is just a straight tank 6.4 meters and then uh, adapter tank that doesn't have any fuel and then we have the SSMEs. These are the space shuttle main engines. They are going to be our rocket engines for the carrier plane which again has to go into space has to get going pretty fast. You can see here I packed 5,000 meters per second with them and we have four of these F-100 jet engines. Now I know they're placed, uh, eventually we're gonna move them to the back, uh, but right now they're placed here just to make it easier for me to tweak them for the center of mass and center of lift purposes, and then we'll sort it out later. Uh, but we've got the fuel tank, of course, centered on the center of mass, you can see. And uh, these little guys have their own little kerosene, and the F-100 engine is the one on the F-15. So, for reference, so we have eight of those. And I wish we had the engine on the SR-71, but we don't for some reason. It used to be in advanced jet engines by default, but apparently not anymore. So, yeah. That's sad. Uh, we do have uh, J-75, that's... But this uh, F-100 has the best thrust-to-weight ratio, I think of all the engines that we have, all the jet engines. Now, it's possible that we could just take off with the RS-25s and just go really steep and just get on with it. And that's a, that's a possibility. And for an SSTO, that's actually my preferable thing. I don't generally like using like jets, ram jets and all. I prefer just using the rocket engine from the start though. You can also see the downside of that. But, yeah, we will see. We will do SSTO experiments as well. Now, again, this is this blew up because this is the integral structure tank, aluminum and lithium, sort of like the external tank of the space shuttle. Um, this, this blew up. So we had to change that. And so I tried various things. Um, Dalsinea N was the next thing that I did. And here you can see... What I did was I put one of the shielded tanks here and narrowed it and created a narrow version of this integral structure one that doesn't have as much heat shielding and made this back tank heat shielded and I was hoping that the wing would protect this uh, tank. Also the big front tank also. Uh, that didn't work out. These side ones didn't blow up even though they're not uh, shielded. But this center one did. So that didn't work out for me. The NX featured a larger wing, uh, just so that we can get off the ground a little bit better. But you can see our rocket Delta V is uh, diminishing from 5,000 now to 4,000. And we've got additional RCS jets here to try and keep the nose up. So in the hope that, again, the wing would protect this tank if we just kept our angle of attack high like the shuttle does, but we're not coming back down from orbit, we're coming back from a suborbital trajectory, and so it's very hard to keep the nose up, and as a result, um, well, the tank blew up again. So, then I had the Delsinea B, which is basically me giving up, and so now we have a procedural shielded tank, and it's heavier than I would have liked. We have less Delta V to impart to our space plane. This is still now a 30 ton payload on the top here. And so we'll carry that dummy payload to space, but not bring it back down. Big ass wing. <laughs> Though uh, we've reduced this mass strength multiplier because we didn't need a mass strength multiplier of one. Uh, consider that we are not going all the way to orbit. So. We don't need that much, so that lightens up the structure a bit, but it's still sort of horrid, and we are going to test this now. Now, again, we need to take off from Brownsville and land at Cape Canaveral. That's a minimal thing right now, 
and we're gonna dump the payload in uh, in space. Okay, so now if your wheels are a little bit too far in front, they'll flop on the tail. However, this is exquisitely balanced. Uh, come on, you can do it. I thought the body flap would help flop it. Uh, there we go. So it's gonna it's really good at rotating. <laughs> I really need that. Uh, so yeah, I use the body flap to straighten it up. Okay. Now we do have flaps configured on here. Um, this is probably now too far back to really use it as flaps, but I've got configured as flaps anyway. Flaps uh, change the geometry of the wing, but they're better if you've got like an airliner wing, something close to the center of mass. When it's, uh, the further back it goes, the more these things act like elevons. And in that case, the elevons actually to pull the nose up, you want them to flop up, not flop down. So Delta wings very rarely use flaps, but we'll, we'll give a little bit of flap here. Okay, so I'm going to use atmospheric autopilot. We will set the brakes because somebody's bound to mention it in the comments, but I don't think it'll have that much of an effect because the engines spool up pretty quickly. So here we go, ignition. And again, I know the jet placement isn't great here, but that was just to simplify things. We are still under development. Now we gotta worry about scraping the tail. And I'll probably take advantage of the lip at the end of the runway. Here at Brownsville it's pretty good actually. We can rotate, it's just I don't wanna kill the body flap is all. So we'll take advantage of this bit here. barely is able to get up here but it's right on it so the thrust weight ratio right now is like 0.3 something that says 0.33 so count that as your bare minimum thrust weight ratio with a fairly large wing oh we can raise the flaps now obviously action group that we don't want to reserve a whole lot of kerosene for landing. Uh, five to ten thousand liters will be enough. We have to turn a little bit more northward. You can see where we are here. Uh, but this is about 27 degrees north and Cape Canaveral is at 28.6. So 26 degrees north to 28.6. So we need to turn a little bit further north. This will do. So you might remember me talk about the MAX spacecraft and how much of a pain it was to release it in the atmosphere close to Mach 1, just short of Mach 1, where the AN-225 would uh, let go of it. The problem is trying to break the sound barrier in the midst of that. This avoids that whole situation by with the carrier plane going all the way to space before releasing the space plane. Well, this is a space plane too, but it's all space planes. I action group the jets to action group 1 and the rocket engines to action group 0. So rather than uh, pick an arbitrary altitude or anything like that to start the RS-25s, I'm literally just waiting until the kerosene goes down to 10,000 liters because I don't want to carry it. But I expect we'll be close to 10 kilometers altitude by then. Well, I might actually want to reduce the amount of kerosene we're carrying. How much do we have uh, in this forward tank? 6,000 units. So we've got some in these tanks, of course. I think we'll just reduce the utilization in these. And... go. So then we pull up to 45 degrees in this case because we're looking for horizontal speed more than anything else still. And 45 is a good happy medium. 
Oh, it's tweaking a little bit. Um, let me just reset the atmospheric autopilot. We don't want to deviate too much from prograde as usual. And then of course at higher speeds the jet engines are going to threaten to blow up. So we need to shut them down and then just rock it. We don't want a huge time to wap wap so you can sort of think of the normal rocket launcher trajectory at this point. We want about a minute and a half for the payload to do its thing. Technically the payload's burn time is six, uh, more than 6 minutes, 6-7 six, minutes, so... Giving it time is not bad, but... Giving it horizontal speed is more important. So with the RS-25s that we have on here, the spatial main engines, make sure to configure them as RS-25D slash E's, which are the ultimate variant. So again, like with the RD-58, right click and select that one. Okay, so we are expending all of our fuel. Alright, and our orbital velocity is close to 3,600. Which means that the payload would need uh, 4,200 more to get to orbit at all. So that's not great. Okay, we need to dump this 30 tons off our back. Uh, the rear RCS for some reason isn't working. Let me just check using the... Well, the ISP is configured right, otherwise it'd have a different ISP. But uh, maybe these, this thing doesn't cross-feed. We can turn off the spatial main engines now. We may want to make sure that this tank is behind us. So now, the trip back down. For the time being, we're not really in much atmosphere, so we're going to use Smart ASS for the initial plunge. There's going to be sort of a skipping thing going on. and The early space planes they thought about uh, did this sort of uh, skipping, but ultimately it was decided that it puts a lot of stress on things and lots of heating too. We need the extra thrusters that we've got. These are the ones that are downward facing like this. And also on the tail we have four here. So that can help with holding pitch. But it's still not gonna hold pitch very well for very long. Um, the aerodynamics with it's such a huge wing will force the issue. You can see Florida up ahead. We are currently halfway. The initial boost does not bring us all the way to Florida. We're going to have to use some aerodynamics to glide our way in. Since we have a protected tank this time, I'm just going for 30 degree pitch. It's not going to be able to hold anything much better than that. I'm mostly interested in making sure it holds above the horizon. You can see as we plunge down, that's harder and harder. And it'll start using those RCS thrusters that I placed. They're not very powerful thrusters though. They're only a fifth of the power of the space shuttle's thrusters. They're 400, 400 newtons, so... I don't have better thrusters right now, unfortunately. Another reason why we don't want to force the pitch issue is our aerodynamic control surfaces. We don't want them to blow up. Okay, and we can moderate now. We don't... You can see the progress vector go, being pulled up now, and we're getting closer to the vertical speed of zero and going positive we have a glide here so we'll have a pitch of 15 degrees and actually 10 degrees so we fine and now we're going to be in the atmosphere so once i maybe eight degrees now we can be a little bit just try and glide and we've dealt with the worst of it so we're going to switch uh, Smart ASS off and go to Atmospheric Autopilot again because we are properly in the atmosphere. And if we are aimed properly for Cape Canaveral, we should see 
Tampa Bay to our right. I don't know what the heck that island is, but Tampa Bay to our right is a good sign. We can see our trajectory now is basically pointed right at Cape Canaveral, so we don't need to uh, glide a whole lot more. Somebody during the stream uh, asked me about having the double uh, vertical stabilizers, and I didn't give a good answer at that point. I just instinctively knew that I needed two, but I couldn't answer why. And it's because the I finally figured out it's because the payload would block the airstream to the vertical stabilizer, so we do need two. We can't have just the one, otherwise it'll be blocked, partly. Though, you know, I mean, you could do uh, the little vertical stabilizers that the shuttle carrier plane, you know, the Boeing 747 has, it has little uh, auxiliary ones on the tips of the horizontal stabilizer. So this is um, obviously good type of space plane to have if you think about it. Because you don't have to have another space plane on top of it. You could have a satellite with a booster stage of some kind. Something that can guarantee it getting into orbit. And this could go into space, let go of it, it can get into orbit, and this can land. And this part's reusable. So you've got a reusable first stage here. And it can be used for many things. It's a little bit of a hassle, but you can take a look at our flight time. Uh, 20 minutes or so. It's not too bad. If your uh, satellite or whatever payload and its upper stage happen to be able to boost themselves very quickly, like in less than a minute, uh, that would give this uh, would allow you to switch back to this with enough time to land this. Now we're overshooting just a little bit. Now, oh, and we don't have a runway at Cape Canaveral, unfortunately. I don't. Ha I didn't put Kerbal constructs in here yet, so we don't have anything there. In retrospect, we should have been doing more S-turning. So yeah, uh, we don't have a runway there because the KSC is currently located at Brownsville. And you would use KSC switcher and go to the tracking station to go to Brownsville. But with the KSC at Brownsville, we don't have a runway here. We would need to place one with Kerbal Constructs to make sure like the shuttle landing facility or something was here. But I'm just going to land on the ground. It's pretty flat here at Cape Canaveral. When doing stuff like this, might want to keep an eye on FAR and make sure we're not stalling or anything. You'd be surprised the speeds at which something can stall at high altitude. And especially while turning. Okay, we're at the speeds and altitudes where the jet engines aren't going to explode on me immediately, so let's get them ready. Just in case. Well, honestly, if we had the shuttle landing facility, we'd be in a good place to land at it. We'll sort of go into it like that. If we're going to have to make the sp space plane heavier to carry more fuel, we might want to go ahead and reduce our kerosene and MMH and NTO. I don't think we need all of it. Now I could glide for quite a while longer, but I want to actually land down there, so we're going to plunge down, much like the shuttle does, in order to slow down. We've got excess energy. And we should probably go into locked view, so V, 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 V. Of course this has a huge wing, so there's that. But it's not that light either. If we take a look, um, it's 99 tons right now. That's heavier than the shuttle would be. Just trying to get rid of... I've got to turn off the RCS, it's just annoying me right now. Okay, maybe that's good enough of a slowdown. So, 13. It'll be somewhere around here ish, maybe? I'll go with this. 
we don't have air brakes on here obviously otherwise I wouldn't have had to do so many of the interesting s turnish maneuvers okay how about a little bit of flaps and landing gear based on how we took off I'm gonna assume that we can touch down at about 100 meters per second The land is uh, sloping up to meet us. Okay, brakes. So we didn't need the jet engines, really. Landing is just going to be a matter of practice, especially if you want to do it without using the engines. But anyway, so successful. Oh, it's flopping on its tail again. Pump this fuel forward. It might be the slope that's doing it too. Okay, now it's all good. All right, let's recover this. Okay, I did notice that Space Plane Tutorial 1 being 58 minutes long did not seem to get as many views as other tutorials in the series. Uh, so I am going to call it here to avoid dissuading anybody and we're gonna test the, the bluer on top of this in the next video and my expectation is that I might be shy of orbit but we'll see and then move on to SSTOs we might do the shuttle version put uh, turn the bluer into a sh space shuttle and then go on to SSTOs as you imagine SSTOs are you really need to have things very very trim and if you're using a tank like these shielded tanks with a very high dry mass, that's not going to work. So what we're going to do about that, well, we might have to figure something out. <laughs> so that's, that's a whole other topic. Uh, first, we'll try and do this. So with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.